All right. Um, shalom, shalom. Rastafari. So we're going to go on to the second, the second part of this review. This review, as we try to uh, make mention in the um, 36th, uh, um, the first part that we posted for this week's uh, Torah portion, when you step up all that, ha lotika nesitulekwis. Um, there's a lot of elements in this that we see that there is a, a right now, that it's like a rhema, there's a rhema word and a rhema application. You understand there's a rhema application to this. In fact, even in the last series of videos, um, we've been picking up on it as well. We've just been, you know, fo following the Holy Spirit, you know, following the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to, to, um, um, research, study these things, and also to present them as well. But we're seeing there's a bigger application in this that helps us to overcome, use these stumbling blocks, that which was formerly stumbling blocks, as um, stepping stones. So here I want to speak a little bit more on um, on on uh, the Torah and and the importance of 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 of, of, of Torah studies of Torah studies, of studying the law, you understand, and study of the law, firstly, is, is the studying of the scriptures and, and the Torah portion and the, and the weekly sabbatical readings and feedings and, 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 and both individually, you understand, we, there's that individual responsibility, even if there's not a group, you understand, I mean, we have so much technology also available, so many different um, um, resources out there. And also at our website, www.lojsociety.org, there are resources that are there that one can use forward slash study is one example. And there's also um, more resources that we are seeking to put online, um, a, you know, um, ASAP, but as, 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 as we are able to. Now, what we was talking about here, we was in... Um, this particular book right here, this is the book that we're studying um, right here. This is in this present part of our discipleship, so in one's acts on discipleship. Now, you see we have a picture of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad there as well because he's our Elijah. He pointed out to us some very significant and even, even he's been right, you understand, consistently. Even though the truth may be an offense, it is not a sin. You understand? Some might find what he said to be hard to take, and they might dispute this or that. But his his positive claims have been proven positively correct. You understand? So we see him as this particular Elijah, and we touched on in the previous reasoning where we were. Um, we went to Matthew, I think Matthew chapter. Um, Matthew chapter 17, because on Elijah, remember the transfiguration when Peter had said that we should build three tabernacles, and this is what you have presently, where we in this wilderness have not listened to that voice of Yeshua HaMoshiach. We have not listened to that son who, right here, here's, here's what you have right here when um, Peter said that it is good for us, right? He said it is good for us to be here if thou wilt. He says, let us make here three tabernacles. So you have the so-called, as we say, one for thee, you know, the so-called black Christians, one for Moses, right? Um, who would that be? Would that be the black Jews? Or that would be more the Rastafari on that level. And one for Elias, and for the black Muslims. So now we see how the, the black um, diaspora here in the wilderness, who according to a plain and direct reading of, of uh, Torah and here the book of Numbers, would show that they are of the Beta Israel. You know what I'm saying? They are of the Beta Israel. You know what I mean? Or the mixed multitude the Hebrews, and they may not be Israelites, but they might be Medeanites. They might be um, even some Moabites and, and other tribes. Even the Moabites cannot, cannot serve. The males cannot serve, but that's a whole another 
aspect right there that touches in modern time on the Moors. But here we have these three tabernacles. When they saw that, that Yeshua was transfigured, Peter had said it is, we should make three tabernacles. And this is denominational kind of isms and schisms where you have one is for the Christians, one for thee, because speaking to Christ, one for Moses and the black Moses. Everyone looks at the black Moses to be who? To be um, uh, Marcus Garvey. So, And then Marcus Garvey, the movement really fulfills, in a sense, in Rastafari, in the Rastafari movement. So suffice that to say right there, one for Moses and one for Elias. So who was Elijah? Who was Elijah? But now the voice that came back out of the heavens was that, and this is obviously the voice of the Father that spoke out of the cloud, said, Behold, right? This is, is Behold, which said, This is my beloved Son. This is the Son of God in whom I am well pleased. I am well pleased in him, so listen to him, hear ye him, that all are to hear him, and this is this is one of the particular riddles or enigmas, some might say, of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and of his particular um, movement. That although they said that they were Muslim, they a lot of what Elijah Muhammad spoke on was Christianity or the Gospels, and 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 he ministered it in truth. You understand? He might not have believed some of the things that other churches hold as their credo or their canon on some level, denominationally speaking. He didn't conform to their particular um, um, whitewashed church dogma. But as far as presenting to his people the word of God, we have to say that Elijah Muhammad, he fulfilled that where it said, to hear ye him, in other words, to hear Yeshua Ha Moshiach, to hear the Son of God. So let's move this over right here for a moment. So we have this picture of Exodus, movement of Jah people. So to hear ye him. So it was the fatherhood of God. You understand? Know reminding, you understand? Know reminding those whom he has sent to listen to Yeshua. So they all look to Yeshua, Ha Moshiach, to listen to the testimony of Christ. You understand? Now we have Christ in his kingly character, who Rastafari say is God or God the Father. You over And then we have Elijah Muhammad, who says the black man is God. Now we have, once again, the restoration of the true name, Yeshua, Yehoshua, you understand? As well as the, the, the true humanity. You understand his true humanity. If God is one of us, if he was one of us, if Christ was human being, if he appeared in flesh as a human being, then this is his approximate. You understand? This will be his approximate racial identification as an Ethiopian. So it's very interesting that Elijah Mohammed, who said this is a nation of Islam or the nation of Salam, the nation of peace. Remember, Malkan Sadek was the king of peace. Let's understand that. So people say, well, he was dealing with Islam under the pale red Arabs. And he says, no, I'm not dealing with Islam under the pale red Arabs. I'm dealing with the original, your original thing. And showing us about our great heritage, our lost history, who we are as a lost people. And, and, and pointing out directly to us our faults, our flaws, and confronting directly the prophets of Balaam, of the counterfeit so-called religion or orthodoxy or pseudo-Christianity. You understand? But let's look at his works. You understand? People say, well, what about his personal work, so forth and so on? You understand? Biblically speaking, he did nothing wrong. There was no child abuse or none of that. That's a whole other kind of an issue. You understand the main issue. Look at even the one who accused him. You understand? You know, he bit the hand that fed him, Malcolm X, basically. You know, I mean, a summary judgment. You understand? Did he not say important things? Was he not one of our great intellectuals? Yes. Yes, of course. You understand? And we celebrate that. But the, the true story is that he made, a, he made a terrible and an awful mistake, not just in the Nation of Islam side of it, but also vis-a-vis -vis the OAAU 
based on his Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie, Ketamari Haile Selassie, the first is organization of African unity, and we look at the works, look at the works, you know what I'm saying? Look at the works. You see, folks don't want to look at that work. You know what I'm saying? And if any of the Europeans were to do half of what either of them have done, you know, let's deal with the ones who who, who we have uh, more most recent evidence of, His Majesty, and his imperial majesty and Elijah Mohammed. And it's interesting that it's at the same time that although they did not speak directly, they are they are speaking to the same people. You know what I'm saying? And to the same cause. You know, and there's no direct communication because based on this overstanding here from Matthew chapter seventeen, there didn't have to be any direct you understand, any direct um communication as it were right now the disciples had asked Yeshua they asked Yeshua and his disciples asked him now, Christ, the disciples of Christ had asked him, by right, his Talmudin, his uh, Dek uh, Mezamora tomb, they asked him, why then say the scribes, in Gadis, Afoch, like the scribes, you understand, Suleiman Yilalu, Elias, Askemoli, Metta, Yigebawa, why do they say that Elias, that Elijah must first come? He you know, said, so why must Elijah, in that sense, first come? Why do we have to have an Elijah to first come? You know what I'm saying? If we really look at our history, if we really look at what, where we're at now and how so much is made plain and, and revealed to us, and we can see who were the real heroes, you know what I'm saying, the real Hor Horuses, the real Cheruyan, the real elect ones, you know what I'm saying? Why do we say Elijah, even Elijah Muhammad, is likened to this one who must first come? It says, Yesu sim meliso. And Yesus answered and said to them, Elias truly shall first come and what? Restore all things. Eliasima askedmo yimeta hulunim yakenal. He's going to straighten out everything. You know, and he will, he must first, you know, for this people to be even ready for repatriation, to be ready to come out of, of Babylon, as it were, to, to truly um, be worthy of that inheritance, right? What does it say right here? That Elijah, right, Elijah must first come. Why must Elijah first come? Because he must restore all things. All, all, what, what things, what things is, is he going to restore? You know what I'm saying? What things is he going to renew? The new black man, the really new black man, you know what I mean, has come through the efforts of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, not just for those who are members or parts of the Nation of Islam, but for other black people, other black men who saw that example, you understand, who saw that particular example. And the, the issue about Farrakhan is, is a separate issue. We, we're speaking right here on the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the connection, you understand, with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and his Imperial Majesty, you understand, whom in the world, these are separate tabernacles. If you look at it, they are separate tabernacles. People will say, well, those of this is the Rastafarians, and here, well, this is the Ethiopians, and, the, and then maybe the Christians and the Jews and, and some of the Mohammedans. You know, they try to separate it. They try to divide and conquer, and we don't get it yet. How, how ancient Ethiopia had all these different groups, and before the white man came there, you know what I'm saying? Before the serpent came into the garden, these people were living at peace with one another. Did they have 
skirmishes or differences, but it was not along these racial or tribal in the sense that we have today, you understand, which really threatens our, our, our divine heritage. They threaten the integrity of Ethiopia, and therefore they threaten the divine heritage. Now, notice the connection between the tabernacles, one for, for Iesus, right? One for Iesus, one for Moses, and that would be for the Rastafari in this time. You understand? Revealed. And one for Elias or Elijah, one for the Muslims. See, they try to still divide us along those so-called um, religious or cultural lines. Now, we're going to learn some things in the book of Numbers about this tribalism problem and how if we don't resolve it, how Yah, you understand, how Jah will resolve this, this tribalism, you understand, this, this so-called tribalism issue which threatens to tear apart the very fabric of the Beta Israel, you understand, of his people, of this great people, right, of so-called black people. So Elijah had to come to restore all things, re to restore all things over here in the wilderness for us. But I say to you, right, verse 12, that Elijah is come already. He's saying that Elijah has already come. And not, not like in the future sense, but you can already see that manifestation, and they knew him not. And, and look at that, and they knew him not, but have done to him whatsoever they listed. They did whatever they liked to the, to the name and even to his memory, you understand, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they've done to his memory whatever they, 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 they have liked. Almost like the same thing they did to Christ. They've whitewashed him. They've effeminized him. They've done all kind of crazy stuff and evil stuff to, to the name and to him and to his majesty. You notice that with the righteous. You know, when you really check out what they've done, what they stood for, you really find them to be men of integrity. You understand? Or we can say black men or Ethiopians of integrity. You understand? Yet, if you look at uh, popular demonization, remember who controls the airwaves. You understand? Who controls the airwaves. But his time is, 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 is done. You know, it's, it's, it's the done time for their control of the airwaves. The prince, you understand? The prince of the air. He controls the media. He controls what people feel in that atmosphere. He, he has an atmos atmospheric, in a sense, effect on people's minds and emotions and ideas that have most people reject you understand this unity that we are saying the scripture is speaking on and we're going to have to comprehend and understand if we're to come out of here, you understand, John's way. If we're to come out of here, his way. You see, the wilderness it's interesting because we was in the Schofield Study Bible. Remember, this is still on the wilderness because the wilderness is the big, you know, the wilderness is the big theme right here. You know, because there's an important wilderness theme. And if my recollection serves me well, there was a note that I had touched on concerning the wilderness where it, it speaks about... Um, you know, what the wilderness is symbolic of. You understand? The wilderness was symbolic of almost a preparatory. It was a place of, you can almost say, a place of preparation for them. You understand? A place of preparation for them. But um, it was a necessary discipline. It's on page 186 of the Schofield Reference Bible. So those who have a copy make a note of 186, page 186, the Schofield Reference Bible, under chapter 15, there's a note on the wilderness. And just this portion of it, it says that the wilderness was part of the necessary discipline of the redeemed people. So a redeemed people go through a wilderness experience. Let's make a note of that. A redeemed people. Now, this should be overstood as the people, as a collective mass or group, but it should also be overstood on an individual level. 
a redeemed person also based on that same law and principle. Remember, these are spiritual laws we're learning here. Based on the same spiritual law and principle that an individual also can go through a wilderness experience. And each of us individually have to recognize that that duality, the oneness of that duality, both as the individual to get our individual head and heart and to come together with others now who have gotten their heads and heart in alignment. That is the foundation. That's the crux. That's the key for true unity and progress, Yosin, as a people. But it was not years of wandering. John did not intend for them years of wandering. It is their own disobedience, right? It is their own disobedience that led them to these years of, of wandering. That was completely due to their lack of belief, lack of faith, you understand? Um, lack of trust, lack of confidence, we can say, in Jah's way. You know what I'm saying? We have confidence that the word of Jah is true and the testimony of his majesty, you understand, know the teaching of his majesty, and the testimony of his Christ is correct, that we will be about these things, we will be studying it. You understand? We'll be learning it individually, initially, and then when Jah wills, when he is pleased, when he it, it has brought those circumstances about, then also in collective fellowship. You understand? See, too often we're trying to push it on somebody else or trying to make some disinterested person, you understand, um, um, get it before we really grow up. So we have to recognize that individual accountability. You know, we're saying we talk about I and I, that individual accountability. So they wandered for 40 years because of their, their lack of admittance, their lack of willingness to see this connection that we're showing you, this connection between who Elijah Muhammad was. His message was not just to the nation of Islam. It was to the black man, to every so-called black man, woman, and child in America. And he told us about this, this experience of the wilderness. He was telling us that we were in the wilderness of the Americas, both North America, South America, because it's an important tribal connection, uh, or, or we can call that ethnic connection between the African-American and even the so-called Mexican or the, the Hispanic-American, you understand, and the, and, and the Mexican and, and the Hispanic that we have to make right here. Because while we were looking up, um, going over a review of this, right, going over a review of this, well, 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 should we go there right now? Well, since we mentioned it, let's just go there um, just to put this into the record, and hopefully we'll be able to go into a little more detail of this. So this has a very important point right here, right? Because so the scholars, remember the scholarship level, remember the three lights? You understand the first candle? You understand that first light the, or, the, or the first candles for the, the novice or his, his belief? You understand? The next candle is about faith or amen, right? And, 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 and the third one is, is, is a mastery. You understand? Is, is, is that mastery. We know that Moses, he received his mastery degree in the Egypts, in the Egypt of Egypt and the upper Egypt of Ethiopia, the Medeanite degree. We understand that. You understand? So, so there's a, a need to, to hear the word. That's where faith, you know, faith cometh by hearing and, and hearing by the word of God. You understand? As well as um, to read it for ourselves, to become familiar with it for ourselves. You understand? Then to study and to show ourselves approved to God as a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing, rightly explaining the word of truth, rightly comprehending it. You understand? That means you can be a real service, you understand, in the kingdom of God and in, in, in Jah's world order overstand that, right? Um, so now another Midrash, another Tanan, another teaching or study, it taught that the Torah or the Orit, which, which here would be considered comprehensively the Old Testament, but specifically the first five books, was given in the wilderness, 
because they preserve the Torah, right? They preserve the Torah who keep themselves separate like a wilderness. That we preserve the Orit when we keep um, it separate like how a wilderness is. Now remember also Christ, Yeshua, his, the first of the testings or the devil temptations occurred in the wilderness. So now there's a further um, at a at a high school and kind of a collegiate level, a higher knowledge of the scholarship level of one's discipleship where you now put into context the Moshiach, Christ being in the wilderness, right? And when you recognize that, well, Christ was in this particular wilderness and he was tempted by, by um, the devil, Diablos, and what we learn from that. Now, a very important reference, we're not going to go into that, but would be in, in Matthew. Look in Matthew's um, um, gospel. Matthew's gospel, um, I think it's chapter, what is it, three or four. There's a footnote there, um, a very important footnote concerning the temptation of um, the Moshiach. How did the Moshiach overcome those temptations? Because you have to understand and you have to learn that. Why? Because these are the same sort of temptations that we, too, go through as a newbie or as a newborn. You understand? When we still are children, are little children, you know, once you accept this and, and you repent and, and you've begun that process of, 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 of taking on and taking in, receiving Yeshua, receiving the Word, receiving the truth of it, and recognizing what you have to do in that, in that process. It's a process. It's a walk, a certain kind of walk, but it begins with, it begins with being born again from above. You understand? Taking on that knowledge and then planting that seed in your heart and growing up in that word. We begin to come to those levels where we have those temptations. And when we look at the temptations that Christ endured in the wilderness, recognize that he overcame that because of the resources of Torah, that Yeshua only overcame these same temptation that he went through because of the resources, you know what I'm saying? Because of the resources that he had in and of the Torah. You know, and when you study that for yourself, you'll recognize when how, how Satan, he used the Bible, but in, 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 in a wrong order, subtly, very subtly, but Yeshua checked him on all of those things. So that's something that we have to understand. So the wilderness, it was a necessary discipline. You know, so sometimes we lament saying that, oh, we should have went to Africa back in the 19, you know, some say we should have went to Africa back in like the 1960s or whatnot. The people wasn't ready. Some would say the people still aren't ready. You know, and that just is a, is a further um, um, lamentation for those who, who, who still are not ready. Um, yeah, so in continuing this, right, in continuing this study right here, um, we want to touch on, on, on this particular connection. Um, when we touch on Elijah, the Elijah connection is very, very um, you know, the Elijah connection is very, very important. And uh, so this is like the second vid that we're just doing, since the Elijah Muhammad connection in Matthew chapter 17, how Peter wanted to build three tabernacles. You can see that with, with, with how on, a, on religious so-called level, one says, says Moses, the other one says, says um, Elijah, Elijah Muhammad. You know, one says the Black Moses, uh, Marcus Garvey, but moreover um, Rastafari, his Imperial Majesty, and one says Jesus Christos, one says Jesus Christ. You know, and that is a perfect um, um, targum or turgum. But now Christ said right here that they would do whatever they please to Elijah. And we see within the memory of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they've done that even to raise his disciple, his disobedient disciple, 
you know what I mean, above and beyond the one who even that disobedient disciple, Malcolm X, would admit and has already admitted on the record that it's because of Elijah Muhammad, so forth and so on. Um, now, the, it says that then the disciples understood that he spake to them of John the Baptist. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him. Okay, this is a this is a lunatic right here, but it's kind of interesting. Let's just go on. Kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. Notice how they have the K at the end of lunatic? Yeah. And sore vex, for oft times he falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Now, this is interesting right here. Now, what does Yeshua say? Yesus and Melso. O faithless and perverse generation, perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Yeah, what is he? What is Amtut Allah. And Yeshua did what? Yeshua rebuked the devil. Right? He rebuked really the, the demon, Yesu Sim. Um guesses oh Gane Numa Ka Ursu Weta. And he departed out of him and that 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 um that demonic um entity, that thought, that that is it's a it's a thought, it's a spirit, it's an entity, right, departed out of this lunatic. And the child was cured from that very hour. Um Right? And then notice this right here. Then the disciples, then came the disciples to Yeshua apart, privily, you know, on the side. You know, once come to you and I, I want to speak to you over here, over here. You know, they, they spoke to him on the side apart and said, oh, why could not we cast him out? Because <laughs> In other words, they wanted to know why they wasn't able to do anything with this one. In other words, why we and y'all may we may be learning this word, but why we're not able to act on it, in other words. It's kind of the same thing. You know, we well, okay, we see the so-called Jews who call themselves Jews, the European Jews, with all their faults and flaws and idiosyncrasies. They still can act on this, you understand, know, for their benefit. But then we say, you understand, know, how come we cannot act on it? And if you notice something, this idea of division that that heaven rebuked. You remember when they saw the three, the the three of them there transfigured for Jesus, Jesus speaking with um. Um, Elijah and Jesus um, speaking with uh, Musa or Moses. That when Peter saw that, he said, "What a you know what a wonderful place this is." You know, um, we need we should make three tabernacles. And remember how the tabernacles that we're studying here. How many tabernacles were there? You understand how many tabernacles were there? among the Beta Israel. One, two, three. There's only one tabernacle. In fact, we are gonna learn a little bit later on about the sons of Kore. The sons of Kore and when they try to set up another tabernacle. You understand? In fact even we learn about this when Moses his his elder sister and brother yeah, you know, his elder sister and brother. Now notice something going on here too. How it seems in many of these instances that Yah chooses, that Yah chooses the youngin. Have you noticed that? Have, have, have you noticed that? 
that that Jah chooses the youngin. So we're going to also learn in this particular section that when they were out here in the wilderness, that um, Miriam, Mary, his sister, and and Aaron, to some degree, it doesn't really tell to what degree, had um, spoke um, against Moses for marrying the Ethiopian or Medeanite um, woman. And some are confused, was she Ethiopian, was she Medeanite? The answer is very simple once you approach it from an Ethiopic perspective. You understand? Know she was an uh, Ethiopian. You know, it's like, it's like if you're in America, right, wherever in America, but if you're American, you're American, you're, you're part of that culture, you understand? Whether you have the paperwork or not, you still can see yourself American, right? And then if you're in a certain state, you know, like if you're in Texas or if you're in New Mexico or California or New York or Atlanta or, you know, um, you're in that particular state. So it depends on how you define or how your locality is defined. Now, it, it also depends on how someone else approaches you, too. So when we're reading in this particular Torah portion, the 36th Torah portion, um, the Halotika, when we are reading about um, um, Miriam and how she caught leprosy, you understand? How Miriam caught, caught leprosy is very, very interesting. It's, it's very, very interesting. You know, all this tribalism, you understand, all this kind of tribalism, all this light skin, dark skinism. You know what I mean? All this nonsense. When you really come to the perspective to see who these people are and what has been done to us and how many ones have given their lives and, and their resources and everything to try to get this message out to the people and for the people still to forsake it, well, you know, there is judgment. You know what I'm saying? So let's understand the Torah in its right and its right proportion right here, right? You see this right here? We'll put this right here. All of us, you know, um, very few have linked, you know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad properly with his imperial majesty. And may we be of those very few to, to link it, show it, and prove it. Now, here is the Decalogue of the Jewish star. Um, and it's the Torah on top. Right, Torah, right, Tawaret, right, anyway, um, and grace, right, here they have the word Ches, uh, or Chesed, 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 like Hasidim, or Hasidim, right, and then we have judgment, right, and the judgment there is Dean, Dean, like the Dean, right, Dean, right there, right, Dean. Now, it's interesting. Because um, Muslims will tell you about the Deen of Islam, you know, the Deen of Islam, the Deen of Law, the Deen of Islam, or the judgment of, of Islam, or the judgment of submission, um, or you will get the judgment of Allah according to their theology. Remember, and once again, our Elijah warned us about the pale and the red Arabs. It's, it's, it's Malcolm X that would. Um, countermand the command. And now you see a lot of black Muslims today, they're kind of under the same thing. And they're hating on the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, not recognizing in a modern sense they were hating on one of the few and true prophets. You understand? In the true New Testament sense of prophet. I, I, I just want to, I want to emphasize that because New Testament has prophets. Some folks will try to say, oh, you know, and try to go to the Old Testament sense of prophet. They're not overstanding prophet, and the New Testament is one who speaks the ten beats. You understand? One who preaches the ten beat, one who preaches accurately and rightly on the words of prophecy. You understand? When they say the prophetic word at the right space and the right time and to the right people, you understand? That is a New Testament prophet. And, yes, there are prophetesses as well. You understand? But remember the key, the qualifier is truly to speak the word of the prophets and not your own words, not your own like, you know, like people say, I'm a prophet, and, they, and if anybody oppose them, they're going to speak a, a hell and fire and brimstone message on that individual. 
for that individual told them they were wrong, and if you really look at it, they might really have been wrong in that instance, or more instances than that. But those are false prophets there. So how to tell the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet, right? Um, that in the New Testament is to speak that prophetic word, and there's many prophetic words that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad spoke to us, that 40 years later, a lot of folks are beginning to revisit the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and see everything and everybody that alleges to counter man, like even his own flesh and blood son, um, Wallace D. Muhammad. Have you noticed that too, brothers and sisters, that Wallace Muhammad and Oscar Wilson, it's like there's something interesting, like similar to them. We have these two great men here. You understand who virtually lay down their lives for the love of God and their people. You understand to 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 save them with the the, the truth. You understand and with the real rebuke and the real warning. Rebuke them in season, out of season, and they would have such children. You understand, and, and you see it kind of biblically too. And, and this is not to anticipate anything or whatnot like it, but it's very interesting. You understand. Um, but then this Torah portion also is teaching us about that, that, that it's those who teach, you know, send others and others' children Torah, truly who teach them the law. A lot of our, our young folks and, and black people are out there of all this killing and shooting and feeling hopeless is because they don't understand the divine laws of life. They, they think they understand, you know, what I'm saying? but the laws they understand is the law of sin and death. There's a law of sin and death. In the Bible, Paul talks about this law of sin and death. And that's the law that they need to be freed from, if you really understand. That's what the Bible is truly and duly, you understand, truly and duly speaking about and speaking and speaking to. But let's go on and look at this right here for a moment, all right? Let's get some light or illumination on this right here. So we have, at this particular point right here, this is Torah at the top. Now, it, it, it's almost like a balance in a sense, right? Now, it's something interesting. There's something called the seven, the seven medieval liberal arts. The seven medieval li liberal arts, right? And if I recall it correctly, it was, I think, grandma, Right, it was it was grammar, rhetoric, and logic were the first three. Grammar, rhetoric, and 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 logic. Now it's explained differently, I think, on different charts. But I saw it in the video, um, secret in plain sight. I was reminded. I heard about this before, because you know when you hear about liberal arts, where did it start? Very interesting to see where these things start, and actually, you know, it go back to the middle, so-called Middle Ages. It really start started when the black Hebrews, whether they were black Jews, whether they were black um, Christians, whether they were um, black um, Mohammedans, when they civilized Europe. So it was the Hebrews, that black nobility, that civilized Europe. It was great black men like this, like who you see before you. You understand? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the king of kings, Kadamawi Haile Selassie I, you know, that is through the wisdom of these, when you read these um, men's testimonies, books, and, and, and actual utterances, to recognize that none of them went to no uh, European colleges or had a European education, and yet even the European to this very day, if he's honest, and when he's honest, has to bow down to the wisdom, not just for black folks, you understand, but the wisdom for all. And this now kind of segues and brings us once again around to this this um, area in the scripture right here about the wilderness and the different studies on the wilderness where the Torah, right, had been given to the is had not been given to the Israelites in the land of Israel. Because that tribe on whose territory it was given would have said that it had a prior claim to the Torah. Now, I want you to note, brothers and sisters, interested in the Federation, Ethiopian World Federation, make a note of what I've said here, as well as in the previous vid, and study this from this Torah portion, and pray for the wisdom to really see what, what the Holy Spirit has shown us. 
you understand, and see if you can see it, see if it makes sense to you as well. It's similar to that that land grant authority was not given in Ethiopia in the sense of those who went over there, pioneer settlers, you understand, as you hear it, but actually was given from to us here in the wilderness, you understand, with the establishment of the Ethiopian World Federation uh, in 1937 by Dr. Malako Emanuel Bayan and the other honorable Afro-American, the honorable Ethiopians over here who established Ethiopian American, the so-called Afro-Americans, African Americans, so forth and so on, right? Um, because if it was given over there, you, you know, like we have the Jamaican suffer today, right? I said, well, what about Afro-American suffer? Then I thought, it's a way. If we look at this tribal allocation of the land and we now study the Torah, at this point and other points, right? And now let's see if we can um, segue to the original issue we wanted to, the original study we wanted to touch on, and that was about the tribes and the order of the tribes. So it's very interesting here, this particular portion here about the Torah, why it was given to them in the wilderness. And I say, well, why was the authorization, you understand, for the land grant given, you understand, uh, to the federation and to those responsible elders, Many of them who have passed away and, and at, at this present time and others who are, it's a change of the guard, you understand? Others who are getting into that transitional phase of their, of, their, of their lives, right? So it was given in the wilderness so that all would have an equal claim to it. And I use this, this reasoning from our divine heritage to make the same positive affirmation, not just for us and for this society, but every Rastafari, every Ethiopian, Hebrew, black man, you understand, woman and child must also make this claim for themselves, if they're individual, for their family, you understand, for their household, for their tribe, you know, in other words. Now, understand this. We're still studying this, right? But understand the, the, um, the relation, the relevancy of it. So another Midrash taught that as the people neither sow nor till in the wilderness. That's why we don't lay down permanent roots here in the wilderness. A lot of folks have been conned into that, and that's the teaching of Balaam. That's t the teaching of Balaam. You understand the so-called prosperity, Balaam, uh, God spell or God spell. You understand because if you know grammar, you understand if you know if you know the Torah, you understand grandma. You know that's grandma and the and the schoolmaster and the nanny, Mogzi, grandma and the Lord being of the mother. You understand you won't fall under that God spell because you understand that way. The people then sow nor till in the wilderness, and those who accept the yoke of Torah are relieved of the yoke of earning and living. This is why the European Jews established these yeshivas for their sons and in some cases also for their daughters as well. You know what I'm saying? And during that particular time, like right now, a uh, European Jew especially can say, he can, he can say he's on Wall Street making a lot of money. He say, you know what, I really want to study Torah. I I want to get back to my roots, as he would claim, right? And um, he, he decides to go to Israel for a while. He can go to any kibbutz or any community and study for a couple of years. You understand? There's a certain apprenticeship time. You know, uh, one, there's, a, there's a limitation, but it's almost like five years, you understand, of being able to study Torah. And if he wasn't even able to afford it, there are programs and means that take American taxpayer dollars or taxpayer dollars that are being cut from Negro, black, and colored programs. So let them cut those Negro, black, and colored programs. We must reclaim our heritage. You understand? We must reclaim our, our birthright and live within the covenant. You understand? And then these things are ours too. They always were. But when our ancestors turned their back, they, they lost that and us following and, you know, what we do by tradition. You know, a lot of Negro folks, this is what they do in my family. This is the tradition. Uh, 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 some of it, a lot of it, most of it, maybe all of it, you have to come out of right there. Because the yoke now of Torah, this is the yoke of discipleship, right? They are relieved, the yoke of earning a living. So, and, and the wilderness does not yield any taxes from crops. So, scholars are free in this world. 
the scholars. Remember, the scholar is the second level. Is, is is the second, you could say the second grade is a scholarship grade, because the first grade is the grade that most of you all might be on where you're hearing this word, maybe studying a little bit. But that scholar level, it's, it's a more intentional discipleship. You know what I'm saying? It's an intentional, just like, like you would study if you're in school. A lot of you all are in school you know, for certain colleges or trade schools, and you know the kind of study you have to do to keep your grades up and to qualify, so forth and so on. Well, of course, that requires um, for the churches, such as the local church and groups and responsibility to in increase so that iron sharpen iron and we can truly be our brother and our sister's keeper. But the scholars are free, you see, in this, in, in this world of the Gedam, in this world of the wilderness, in this world of the Midbar, right? And another now Midrash, it taught that the Torah was given in the wilderness because they preserve the Torah who keep themselves separate like a wilderness, this is why, like, even a lot of the, the monks and, and, and ones in the Ethiopian and Ethiopic church tradition, the Bahitawis and, and the, um, um, the Debtelas and, and others go out into the wilderness and the mountains. And also because the, the dry, the, it's drier out there and can preserve the manuscripts and scrolls. So there's also some practical, you know, there's some practical, um, there's some practical reasons for that as well. Now, with that um, being understood, this is also interesting right here. Um, it speaks about, like, why some were numbered, and those who were numbered had died in the wilderness, but the Levites, they were numbered separately. The Levite, and they entered the land of Eretz, uh, Eretz um, Yisrael, they enter the land of um, Israel. Um, and a Midrash offered another explanation for why the Levites or the priests were not numbered with the Israelites. It's almost like why we, who are of this society of Ismaelites, who are Rastafari, must, must separate I and ourselves from that false artificial status. And you have to upgrade your paperwork and get your status correct. Otherwise, you are numbered under that numbering with the, like the Israelites who were in the wilderness, you understand, but they were ignoring that divine call and the word, right? Um, the Levites were the palace guard. I like what this Midrash here had said, and this kind of connect with the Kibra, um, um, the Kibra, the Benya, right? A Midrash offered another explanation why the Levites, and remember Levites in the Old Testament is the order of Melchizedek, which is the order where the Messiah, Yeshua, yes, was Christos, our black Lord and Savior. He is the high priest to his father and our father, Abba Kedus, Kedus Abba Tachin, were not numbered with the Israelites. The, talking about the multitude, the, like to say the riffraff, spiritually, theologically speaking. The Levites were the palace guard, right? The elect, right? The Chiruyan. And it would not have been consonant with the dignity of a king that his own legions should be numbered with the other legions. In other words, his own troops, his own hosts, his own armies. You understand? So the, so the original intention was that all of Israel would become the priests, so that, that all of them would have been the kings and the king of kings own. But it so happened that only those who receive him, you understand, and who have received that new name, or Rastafari, in this understanding of the, the parable, are those of that certain or that particular, that particular um, 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 king. Now, in the wilderness, the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. The Levitical camp was established in 1 and 50, and it served as the place of refuge to which manslayers could flee. In other words, those who had slayed someone until that could be worked out, they could flee there that you wouldn't get um, tribal violence, you know, like gang violence. Gang violence is because the proper courts, which are supposed to be the churches, are not keeping the law and, according to Christ, are lawless, though they may say, Lord, Lord, haven't we done all these wonderful things, so forth and so on. There are other... Um, 
um, things that they are supposed to be doing according to that covenant, even the new covenant in Christ. And so if you look at the old European churches, a lot of them even got to the point that they did a lot of these things. That's why we have a lot of these charities have religious organization names or whatever attached, even though they might be pseudo-government programs. They originally were established by the Gentile Christian church. So see how the lost sheep are really, really, um, are really, really lost. Now, there was a part here, we want to scroll forward, though, the wilderness study. We could probably go more over in the wilderness. Now, here's the camp right here. Here's the camp. So when we're looking at Shashimani, when we're looking at Africa, when we're looking at Ethiopia, in, in, in theory, let's just call it in theory right now, this is the context that we have to begin forming our ideas around. This is the center. You know what I'm saying? This is the center. Now, the only thing that changes with this sort of establishment is that there are no animal sacrifice. And many of us as Rastafari, we say, we say hallelujah for that. You know what I'm saying? Because of our own new birth um, sentiment and feeling and thought and because of his majesty's example, you know what I'm saying, um, to the, the, the creation, the animal um, creation. Now, um, there's more on the idea of numbers that is, that is going into, because it even starts to break down with the connection with the land, right? And we touched on in the first vid the, the, the colors, the degel or the, the banners, right, the banners, which is the flag. That's why some of the earlier videos, and we perhaps to continue on that, you know, even deal with the proper protocol for the flag. The flag is a very important, uh, a very important emblem, as we even learn right here, that governments, the banners, you know how they say that Ethiopia um, flag is what it is in the sense of those three colors, because those those represent three tribes or three peoples who banded together, who coveted together, namely the um, namely the Tigray, the Amhara, and Oromo, the Oromo peoples, and this is true. Mm -hmm. But you have to remember that the Lion of Judah, that that Oromo was attached to that particular flag. Also for a particular, also for a particular purpose and reason to solidify. That's why the lion is situated at that particular point of the flag. To so it, it, it is what brings these parties together, and these parties come together to say that we uphold this monarchy. We we uphold this divine order. This is what we mean when we talk about our our divine heritage, that we uphold this particular order. So let's bring up a flag right here so you can see this. And the proper order of the colors is also the key because I mentioned um, just previously the so-called um, seven um, liberal arts of the so-called Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. Of the Middle Ages, which was a time that the uh, Mediterranean black people, the Hebrews, whether they were of one tabernacle or another, whether they were black Christians, you understand, um, Ethiopian, if they were black Jews, Ethiopian, or if they were black Mohammedans, Ethiopians who call themselves Moors or Amirs, like the black Christians at the height call themselves Amhara, you understand the, 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 the linguistic similarity. So this banner or this this flag we call it the banner of salvation. So so um, because this banner who, which is given to those whom he loves, it, it's a sign. It's a visible sign of the covenant. And if you study this, as this is this is the version from his Majesty time. This particular line, if I'm correct, is from the time of his Imperial Majesty. Mm -hmm. You notice that there is a cross here, and there's also a cross. On the crown. Now, if you notice in the so-called creeping coup, the Illuminati, the Illuminati um, backed um, revolution against the King of Kings. Against the King of Kings, the first thing that they did was seek to change the flag. That's the first thing they did and change the symbol on the flag. 
In fact, it's such an interesting gradual process. A couple of pages are out there that actually document it, what they did with the Ethiopian flag in those first um, years out from the so-called um, revolution, right, what they did with the flag and how they started to change um, certain symbols and everything like that. We have it here in another file. Um, we need to probably put that out as well. Some of you all probably have seen it previously because I think we did speak on it. Um, well, let's see if we can bring up this right here. And when you see that the first thing they did was to, to, um, to uh, change the symbolic meaning on it. I don't know if it's his particular site, Frank uh, um, Shimakura, this one, this certain visitors to Ethiopia, but it was on the flag site out there, a, a pseudo, seemed like a pseudo official kind of like the people knew really, you know, the real deal, what they were dealing with. And so they were able to show how after the the creeping coup or the godless coup, you understand, against his majesty, the great transgression, how they changed, um, they first took, I think, took the cross off. That was the first thing that they did, right? Um, and then they even later on took the crown off. Right, and um, at that time, the Muslims or Mohammedan had, um, I think, had did they, they they brought back again a Lijasu's flag, which we showed you before. That's where where Lijasu kind of lost his he kind of lost his freaking mind, you know. And that's what His Majesty writes about in the autobiography. Let's see if we can bring if we can bring this up as well. But so in this Torah portion. It also deals with the flags and the banners, and there's an important um, teaching. You know, there's an important teaching for us in that as well. Okay, now this is another, this is another site right here with some of the flags, but it doesn't really. Okay, you can see it right there. Let's see if you can see this right here. See if we can um, zoom in on this one. This is not the specific site, but you can see the evidence right here where they take off the, and they put a spear. They put a spear. So it's not the cross. It's not Christianity. You know what I'm saying? It's not Christ. It's not the covenant. But it's a spear that is put on the flag. And then eventually, for all this wearing down, wearing down, the, the line of Judah was completely, and that was the mercy right there, you know, for them to take it off there completely, off of the, you know, the flag, uh, you know, out of that nonsense that they had that they had gotten caught up in to because of the great transgression. Now I keep saying the great transgression because that's what um the Bible says. It's in the Psalm, Psalm nineteen. Now here's another series of flags. This is eighteen eighty one. We can see these banners. So when we're speaking about Ethiopia, when we're speaking about the flag and we're speaking about this Torah portion of numbering, of accounting. We got to account for these things. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we have to know these things and also know what the proper application is. You know, and to also oppose righteously, you understand, um, the misapplication of our symbols. Now, this is another site that kind of goes into um, some of the whole historical movement of the flag and, and the different anthems. Mm. Of course, our anthem goes back to the imperial anthem, you understand, which which they call it the former anthem over here, it, 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 Ethiopia Hoi Des Yibalish, um, Lakish, your, in your God, Hail in the power of your God, Ben Nagusish, and in the power of your king, Ethiopia be happy. Thanks to God's strength and your emperor's wise rule. That was the anthem from 1930 to 1975. You know, so we can actually study the levels of the Freemasonic, the European um, Freemasonic order, you know, understanding, and the co opted Ethiopians, the traitors, the Judas Iscariots that sold Christ and his kingly character out for 30 pieces of um, silver. Yovas. Um, but that other page, we'll bring that up and probably we'll, we'll, we'll deal with that in a part two because then we can more squarely um, 
deal with this particular matter. So stay tuned, more to come. Shalom.